and my B, what's that stand for? Men in Black. But first, business. Octobriana, 1976, my new comic, out in stores everywhere, fluorescent ink, black light effects. Uh, get it wherever you buy comics, in person or online. You can find it at Comixology. You can find it at jimrug.com, along with the 350-page process zine that includes scans of original art and behind the scenes of how this thing was actually made. And it's selling quick, so if you want one in print, pick it up sooner rather than later. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current Red Room comic project for early adopters, man. Uh, Murder on the dark web for fun and profit, man. Three bucks will get you the archive, and issue one is completely up there as we speak. Uh, it, the files are at a high enough resolution that you can make your own bootlegs. Print edition in 2021, man. Anyhow, Jimmy, let's talk. Uh, let's talk Men in Black comics. Came out several years before before the flick. I think this is from 1990. One of my early black and white comics. I had. Uh, now you see this here, right? And, and, of course, this is the Marvel uh, cash-in uh, issue that just reprints uh, issue one of uh, Men in Black. Uh, you take a look at the spread, right? And one of the first things that pops into my mind is, like, you see Air Cell. But this ain't Barry Blair Air Cell. This is Malibu Comics Air Cell that had uh, Eternity Comics and Entity Comics and uh, Malibu uh, just before image so they were trying to be like a proper new york print house or something that would have many little imprints and eternity was the science fiction imprint and the artist sandy carruthers comes from that and got a call from tom mason the editor who who said uh, you know the script came in by his cat named lowell cunningham do you want to draw do you want to draw this comic uh, men in black uh jimmy i was prepared to cut promos on this, like with the same bravado as our Zen coverage <laughs> in the past, because this Lil Cunningham character, we don't hear more about him. You know, he might have done a couple other like little things here and there, but I started thinking like, oh, is this some kind of like, you know, is this the first early uh, examples of um, shitty Hollywood screenwriter? has a failed script floating around in Hollywood and is trying to get some buzz. So jumps into the comics universe. And I did some research on this cat, uh, Cunningham doesn't seem to be that way. He was at this time, he was in a community college in Tennessee. Um, still lives there to this day, you know, was interested in this kind of subject matter, wrote a story. And, you know, many years later, you know, five, six years later, uh, Hollywood, Hollywood came across the stuff. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, the Hollywood version of this, because there are some concepts that are very much in the film, including like kind of the main dynamics between the, the, the two main characters. It's almost like uh, we looked at They Live a, a while back and how that comic had the same concepts that made it into the movie, even though the movie storyline was very different. I think you could say the same thing about this Men in Black comic. Let me cut a couple promos, though. And, and just uh, we have many creators, many young aspiring creators who are interested in making comics uh, as viewers. So I want to point out this indicia real quick. Um, you know, Aerosol Comics, blah, blah, blah. The Men in Black is trademarked and copyright 1990 Lowell Cunningham. That's the writer. And it says creator. Artwork, copyright 1990 Sandy Carruthers. You don't want to get caught up in this. As a young artist out there, if you draw a comic that has never been drawn before, and it's a new concept, you are a creator in, in this thing. And uh, I read some Sandy Carruthers w interviews uh, online before in prep for this. These guys split uh, $500 advance on each of these issues. And then they, and then they, uh, once that 500 bucks was made back from the amount of copies sold, then they started getting their royalties that they also split. Sandy Carruthers did not make another dollar. It sold 8,000 copies. Sandy Carruthers did not make another dollar uh, on this when it when it went off to Hollywood. Uh, you can find uh, many, many writers out there who maintain, you know, the copyright and trademark to their comics that, you know, they write splash page with demon hordes coming uh, down upon two uh, men in black with their limo behind them, and now you have to spend two days to draw this. 
splash page, man. So there are some terrible contracts out there and they persist to this day. And yeah. Some are worse than what you're describing. <laughs> um, but it is common for creator owned, even if it's writer operations, sometimes the writers will throw in a little extra money up front and in return, they, they keep, they own the property. Yeah. So yes, go into this with your eyes wide open, read contracts, negotiate for your rights. Yes. Uh, Don't give these things away for, for 250 bucks. These, the, the writer has written, could write five more comics that month and is throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks and one of them will but you'll have to spend the entire month drawing the thing and that that will be the only uh comic that you'll be making while they are working on five others man so it's it's extremely unfair uh in terms of like the sweat equity going into the thing i do wonder what how, how what, what the ownership of men in black is now to this day yeah because you know marvel buys malibu at some point right you know we have a, a marvel printed issue but we don't have more men in black comics and you think if marvel owned this outright we would have men in black comics because why wouldn't you you right. know i mean it's a concept that lends itself to infinite stories you know it's 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 kind of one of those concepts that's genius in a way men in black right. when i was a kid you know that was sort of a code for anything uh, x files ish anything super uh you know supernatural ufos any of that stuff men in black was kind of the shorthand fun version for it so smart concept but yeah. again the fact that marvel doesn't have 300 issues of men in black comics makes me wonder like what the ownership is and if this writer may have been ahead of the game in terms of setting up ownership and retaining that ownership well i mean it doesn't say copyright, Lil Cunningham. It says copyright and trademark. So right. he took that extra step to go send paperwork off to DC to uh, to get that, which actually sparked, you know, that, like that was another exhibit for me to do a little research on him to see if he really was like a gross Hollywood, like robber baron guy who's going to get an eager beaver to draw his stuff. Did you find an answer to that? It doesn't seem like it. He's Sometimes still living it's in like Tennessee. you have an uncle who's a lawyer and tells you to go do this. Yeah. You know, it's not that you're planning something, but it's just you happen to be, you know, be in the right place, have the right guy whispering in your ear, and there's nothing insidious. It's just a good move. You know, I know a lot of people who have the trademark on their, on their stuff, and it's from, uh, it's from, you know, like the 90s when we. It was actually, at the time, it was thought that that's what you have to do. Like, it wasn't sort of common knowledge that if you make something, you own the copyright to it. You know, like, that wasn't... In, right. It was like, when you read Wizard Magazine articles and stuff, it's like, you gotta do this extra step. Men in Black, uh, the concept, very simple. By the way, the Sandy Crothers uh, design for the more seasoned agent, Tommy Lee Jones is perfect for that role. That's what I'm saying. Like there are parts of this comic that are on the screen, right? And uh, it looks good too. It's 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 in that you know it's 1990. So part of the reason Air Cell is owned by Malibu is probably the the collapse of the black and white explosion, then implosion, and then you sell your company because you're not selling comics, right? Um, but it looks good for a black and white comic. You know, black and white indie comic post uh, black and white explosion. This stuff looks good. This is the era where it was a very common practice and a popular practice to do your work uh, in the black and whites. You know, this is the post-fanzine world where everybody, you know, you aspire to be a job guy at Marvel or DC, but you start at Eternity Comics or First Comics or someplace to get your anatomy up or something. You that know? guy looks awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Straight out of central casting, all these characters, man. And the young hip guy has that has that uh, Mel Gibson, Lethal Weapon-like mullet. Yeah, that's your late 80s uh, haircut. <laughs> Published in 1990, drawn in the late 80s. Sure. <laughs> um, the conceit with Men in Black, it's not solely about aliens. Uh, the three-issue miniseries uh, covers a different subject in each issue. And the very first issue of, uh, of Men in Black, no aliens at all. It's about uh, a drug called Berserk. And it's about a... Berserk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a... It's a um, there's a there's a cult that would be That's how good. amazing this is iconic yeah it's great this is an iconic piece uh, by the way like this comic i had uh, an eternity comic called public enemies that um printed public domain uh crime comics yep. from the golden age and there was an ad for men in black uh in that it had this splash page had this image was in there as well and i like I fixated on it because it's great title and infinite possibilities. Like you said, I could not wait to 
get my hands on this comic, man. And and this is like one of the early comics that I like sought out. Got it at a uh, flea market, man, for, you know, pennies on the dollar. It was also an era too where uh, I, when I, I discover Judge Dredd and I start to fixate on those, get those comics and then like, boom, there's a Sylvester Stallone movie that's being made. And then I fixated on this for a while until I got my hands on this. And then like a year later, boom, a movie's being announced. And I'm like, man, I'm unhip to like so much stuff. Like as soon as I find something, there's a movie, but like it must be popular because a movie is being made about it. But 8,000 copies sold in, in that in that first run. See, here's the uh, the little uh, the little flashlight thing that yep. kind of erases your another thoughts. One, another one of those elements that goes right to the screen. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty decent concept. You know, you you talk about the drug thing that's also connected to a religious cult, like an underground religious cult. So it is. Um, it's very X Files like. You know, the stuff that that they're covering here. Pretty strong concepts, you know. I mean, it's predating X Files. It is. It's uh, it, it's it's nice whenever a decent concept makes it to Hollywood. Sure. You know, like somebody recognizes, oh yeah, we have all these boxes we can check off that this guy figured out that works. Yes, a lot of good high tech uh, in here because you know this is the Men in Black, you know, secret organization, and uh, the writer is definitely among these the three issues in the miniseries. The writer is definitely more kind of like interested in the character dynamics between agent j j and k uh because here go ahead well, i was just gonna say this is a funny tangent where their hairline <laughs> runs together right <laughs> that's what you need to do though is have those kind of character things you know like often um you know you'll get an idea for a scene or a moment or a visual or something but you still need to have that character builds around that for sure um the uh the the unfortunate thing about that is that the the writer is like so fixated on it and and this is uh this lends to great visuals jimmy but everything gets wrapped up in like two pages so like here's issue two is the alien issue and we introduce our alien uh you know bug bug demons they come down and they like are making a pact with this guy who's saying like you want this rifle you got to pry it from my cold dead hands and they're like okay we'll be back and they they come back once a year to see if he died yet so that they could get the, the rifle. The the Will Smith character, we'll call him. The Will Smith uh, is a cop, and he is not relu- he is reluctant to be a man in black. He, he, he has to upset his entire life, and he has no choice in the matter. They have him in the headquarters, and he still is reluctant, even though, uh, you know, he excels at the things he does. He's an underground, like, narcotics fed. This is a good splash page, man, where he wants to leave. He's like, I'm done. This is this is bullshit. I went out of here. And he's going through the labyrinth of the headquarters to end up where he started. And is like, there's no way out. And Tommy Lee Jones is like, it's the same way you came in. But he wasn't awake when he came in. Um, he's going to be given his own set of sunglasses. Oh, and this is where Tommy Lee Jones is hipping him to, to the score, man. You know that movie? Uh, it came from outer space. It's real. It's a documentary. I did think going through this, all the uh, like the tabloid magazines, and they reference those in the movie. That is where you get like oh, you could write this again. Marvel could do three hundred issues of this just with Weekly World News, whatever the storylines are, like literally pulling it from that. Yeah, there's a real fun thing, like you know the uh, little flashlight that erases your thoughts. The uh, the noob gets gets hold of uh, his own. And he tries to shine it on right. on uh, Tommy Lee Jones, and it doesn't work. And he says, uh, "These aren't called Ray Bans for right. nothing." <laughs> I can't remember if Ray Bans are the are referenced in the movie. I know they wear sunglasses, but that feels like the perfect product placement. That again is in the original comic, like it's built for it. <laughs> totally. Another thing that uh, is required uh, by the Men in Black is to kind of scramble the brains of everybody who comes into contact with any of the weird stuff, man. So you know that's what the little flashlight is for um they do a good job with the black and white art of contrasting where black is not applied very often except for their suits yeah you know so they they, they pop they really pop in the black and white comics look at that glacy black and white right it's there a great man. cover man yeah, but you see it's a lot of it's a lot of back and forth you like you introduced a really cool alien and as an artist you want to draw the fight sequence between the uh men in black and the aliens 
but they just wrap that up in like the p last couple of pages and uh the way that it's done is the agent just gives the alien his his own gun <laughs> and sends him off but he's becoming more seasoned even though he's reluctant that's the arc here and the, in the uh the final issue it's uh michael j fox guest star i know right look at that <laughs> really good cover right like I like all the covers. Yeah. I even like the logo treatments kind of neat. I like the lettering inside too. You know, it's very simple, but by Diane that. Valentino, man, uh, yeah. uh, Jim, Jim Valentino's wife. All right. So this is a D and D players who release a demon. <laughs> hey, is that a uh, Reggie Byers company? Ooh, victory. It is right. It must be. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. When the demon gets out, it goes through the entire town. So they have to zap the minds of, an entire neighborhood. Look at this that's shit. That's a pretty good drawing. Yeah, it's like this like little shuttle thing that's yeah. going to get them to go to wherever the heck they're supposed to be going in uh, two shakes of a lamb's tail. If I like I, this ad. Me too. Like, if, <laughs> I was going to say, if Chris Ware made this comic, like this would be, this would fit into the... Um, Sandy Carruthers uh, doing art, I guess, in this adaptation too. Yeah, Sandy Cross Carruthers... Cross promotion. Sandy Carruthers drew uh, some some Alien Nation uh, comics that were inked by our good friend uh, Wayne Wise from Phantom of the Attic Comics. Interesting. I think I think uh, Lyle Cunningham wrote those. Oh, he wrote cool. some Alien Nation stuff, I think. Yeah. Keep the team together. Look at these boxy cars, man. That's how we all drew cars back in the day, man. The perspective guides. I kind of like it. It's, yeah. it's a generic car, but we all read that as a car. Yeah. It's not confusing anyone. So you can see this young, sub I mean, this uh, small suburban town just kind of get getting uh, get ransacked a little bit and all the townsfolk are out and about trying to figure out what the heck's been going on. Also, where the heck are our kids? You know, this kind of artwork, like I said, it it's uh, it's that that early level before you, you graduate to go to Marvel and you would see like Malibu Comics, it's almost like their house style. And it is cheap. You know, I think that first issue looks a little, like maybe a little more time spent on issue one than issue three. And that's what happens whenever your advances are $250 an issue or, or so. Uh, you run out of that quick. And now you're st stuck with more pages and, you know, how fast can you turn those pages around? So I think you see a little bit of that. Although there are signs of some good drawing too. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like that's that's a really cool design for that weapon. And, you know, that's the, that's the Deus Ex weapon that's going to take care of that uh, that monster. That's also the mark of, like, I think, young cartoonists where you can draw some stuff well. You know, there's a reason you're here and got the job, but the consistency is a thing that comes with experience. Look at that, dude. That's pretty good. Yeah, it works. Yeah. It looks good for a D&D &D kind of monster uh, demon. Look at that, man. Pointing at... That's a real funny pose. <laughs> like some of it, some of it works really great, like being blown away from an explosion, and then the other parts, like, "Hey, what's up?" <laughs> so, jumping into the deep, our Will Smith analog is now a man, a man in black. Yeah, but I'm not like you at all. <laughs> Are so, you surprised that there's not like? A bunch of these like this feels like a formula like you've you've crafted this obviously it, it works you know yeah. you have franchise movies and tv shows but it feels like he he figures out a lot of this stuff in this comic like that's the template like keep rolling out mini series or more issues or stories um you know you barely scratched the surface on like cool supernatural enemies that they could be facing yeah. it's uh yeah it's so unclear by all record uh the guy who owns the copyright like he didn't get into such a deal with uh, malibu that those guys keep all the money like, he's doing well still lives in the same town or whatever but he's doing super well so maybe he doesn't have that need need to put himself out there and, yeah. and, and, and and do more work you know he he's made enough money to live forever it may have been scooped up early on too you know um it takes a takes a couple years right to turn a, a movie around a big budget movie so it's possible that shortly after the publication uh, you know, he, he options it or whatever and doesn't feel the urge to make more. But for, it, for a comic formula, it certainly feels like this is a good idea for a comic. It is wild, too, that, like, it has... Now, I think there was a trade, and obviously there's the Marvel the Marvel thing. And, and I think there might have been a couple other little things that, that have a Marvel logo that are, like, more movie adaptations or something. But uh, the model that people in comics are have been exploiting for like the past 20 years 20 30 years is um 
the movie is essentially the commercial for your book. So yeah, that's a perennial, you that's know, what I'm saying. You and, know? and there's not even trade paperbacks right. of this thing out there. So it's, it's very, it's very weird. Yeah. I mean, it could be legal tie ups too. Yeah. You know, they might be fighting over who actually owns this thing and who knows, man, but it, it does, it surprises me because it feels like a pretty good concept. I think it's success in other media shows that it's a pretty good concept. And you know, that's, that's something a lot of companies struggle with. I have some more thoughts, but they're to be shared offline, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when uh, the next vids are available. Octobrian is in stores now. It's also available on Comixology. And uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor is where you'll find my current Red Room comic project being serialized for the early adopters. And three bucks will get you that archive. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we're doing. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Like I said, Jimmy, we got some stuff to talk about, man. Give these guys their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>